Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. The word that I want us to begin with is the word justice. The true God is a God of justice. And therefore, his people are going to be individuals that seek as the prophet Zechariah says, and commands God's people to execute justice. And we're going to see in our study this evening from the book of Exodus and chapter 28, the second part of this chapter, we're going to see a unique instrument, how it was made, and how it's related to justice. Justice for God's covenant people. So with that said, take out your Bible, look with me to the book of Exodus chapter 28. We're going to begin in verse 15, where we left off last week. Now, we saw last week that we're speaking about the priestly garments, not the instruments within the tabernacle or outside the tabernacle in the courtyard. We're not speaking about the Ark of the Covenant or the menorah or the showbread or that, that altar outside, nor none of the utensils that were used to make the tabernacle. But now the emphasis is on the Kohanim, the priest. And we began last week speaking of their garments. If we go back for a moment, we see in verse 4, Exodus 28 and verse 4. These are the garments which they shall make. And we saw it's the choshen, the breastplate. Then the ephod, the vest. The ma'il, the coat. The kutonet, tashbats, the checkered tunic. And the mitznefet, that is the turban or the hat. And then finally the avnet, the sash. Now, we've talked about all those garments except for one. We, we did not mention the first one. I talked about how it was odd, it was peculiar that this first garment was not mentioned. It was alluded to, but when we talked about the construction, the preparing of these priestly garments, we ignored that first one because the text did. And now in our verse that we'll begin with, we see that once more, after mentioning the second five, we begin now with the first one, the, the breastplate. Look again at that verse, verse 15. Speaking to Moses, Moses is responsible. He's receiving the instruction in order that all these things can be carried out in obedience to the word we read in verse 15 and you shall make Hoshin Mishpat now right there there's a difference because in verse 4 we simply see the word Hoshin which is breastplate but here we have an additional word attached to it Hoshin Mishpat Mishpat is a word for judgment or justice so this is why we're emphasizing this word because it stands out. The first time he mentions the breastplate, he simply says breastplate. But the second time, we have the breastplate of justice. Look again, verse 15. And you shall make the breastplate of justice. And then it's told like so many other of the garments and utensils. Ma se choshev. A work of, the word choshev, is intelligence. We encountered it frequently. It speaks about thoughtfulness, meaning 
that it requires intelligence to be able to do that, and that intelligence comes from, and here's the key, from the instructions of God. Now, I realize that some want to translate that in more of a secular sense, simply choshev meaning woven together. But this is not uh, able to be derived from the nuance of this word in and of itself. So it's a work of intelligence, meaning that a simple man, remember last week, the ones who are making these are those who have been endowed, who have been filled with the spirit of, of wisdom in their heart. And it's that ability that comes from wisdom, a spiritual wisdom, that gives them the knowledge, the intelligence to do this. And then we see that it's made, keep reading verse 15, ke ma se efod. It is a, a work, it's made like the vest. And it says, this is how you should make it. And when it says like the vest, the ephod, it is uh, similar in material and construction in the sense that it's made of gold and techelet. Techelet is that blue or turquoise color. It's a material, that royal purple argaman and tola'at shani, which is, is crimson. This is how it should be made. And he goes on to say that it's also of a twisted linen, and as I said, this is how you shall make it. Verse 16. So here, there's not really anything new in the sense that so many of the instruments, the vessels, or the garments as we see have been comprised of these same ingredients. Gold, techelet, then we see argaman, Tola'at sheni, and then this shesh, which is linen twisted. And there's disagreements if they're separate and placed together or if they're woven together. And this is the implication of this work that requires intelligence, how to bring them together. Not necessarily in our understanding of that being woven, but placed together in some ways. All of this is unclear, and that's why. See, I hear so many times today people saying things, and here's the problem. They repeat what they hear rather than checking out, doing the dual diligence to see if it's factual. I hear all the time people say everything's ready for the temple to be made. That is a fallacy. I was listening to an individual and this individual is known for marriage counseling. Now, the problem is I don't believe that he has any credentials in counseling for marriage. He has no biblical credentials either, meaning he didn't study in some formal way. He has an honorary doctorate. That's nice. That's an honor. It's not earned. It's not something where he studied thoroughly in order to learn the methodology of interpreting the scripture and the language and such. And he will tell you that everything's ready. The Sanhedrin is in place. There's no Sanhedrin today. Now I realize that it's very popular in many Christian uh, magazines and on websites to say there's a Sanhedrin. No, what there is is a group of primarily anonymous individuals that have said we are the Sanhedrin. Let me ask you a question. By what authority are these the Sanhedrin? None whatsoever. There is no authority that recognizes them. Now, there is something called the Rabbanut. The Rabbanut is a board of rabbis that's recognized by the Israeli government. And this board of rabbis reject the Sanhedrin. So when people just flippantly say there's a Sanhedrin, there is none. We need to realize that so much of what's necessary, and of course we're talking about the tabernacle, but the same garments, the same instruments, utensils, furniture that we've been studying, all of this 
also are part of the temple, that third temple. And none, none, none of these things have been made. There are examples for, for educational purposes by an institute, but that institute, many of you have heard of the Temple Institute, it has no standing either. Nothing authority, nothing recognized that it is the Temple Institute. It's simply a group of people that have formed it, and they do studies, and some of the studies are very good. But there's nothing official. And when they're scrutinized, and they're asked questions, well, how did you make it this way? What was the motivation? Well, we read from this source or that source, but there is a multiplicity of maklokot, which is a disagreement about how it's done. So we can't be careless and flippant with the Word of God. There's many things here we do not know, and that's why the authorities within Israel will say we're waiting for Elijah to come and instruct us in how to do these things properly. Maaseh Choshev, we simply don't understand what that means today. Look at verse 16. Now, in this lesson, we're going to focus exclusively on the Choshen Mishpat, the breastplate of righteousness. Chapter 28, we're going to do in three parts because this is important. We dealt with the first five garments last week. We're going to continue, continue this week with that first one. And notice it says, look at verse 16. Ravua yihye. Now, ravua, usually say ribua, is a square. There's a difference between modern Hebrew ribua and the language of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. Similar, but there are some differences. Ravua, yea, a square it should be. And then we had the way, word kaful. Now, kaful, if you go, for example, as I frequently do, to a, a restaurant here in Israel, and I like hamburgers, and sometimes I'll get a hamburger kaful, which means a double, two of them. Now, most of your translations will say this is folded over. And that could be the proper understanding, as we saw when we were speaking about the tabernacle. One, the same word is used for it to be folded in two. But realize, there's a difference between the word here for kaful, double, or the word for multiplying, because it is kaf, fe, lamed. The word to fold something is kuf, fe, lamed. So lekapel is not the same word, but it may have the same implication in practice for this. What it's telling us that it should be a square. But we're going to realize, if you look as we read on, we find the phrase, zeret arko. Now, the question is this. A zeret is if you take the distance from one's thumb to small finger. This distance from here to here is a zeret. We learn that a cubit is from this place to the end of your fingers. So a zeret, obviously, this is smaller. Now, the question and the debate is when it says kaful, is it double or is it half? Now, meaning, is it double folded over to make one cubic or one zeret? Or is it one folded? If it was folded in this way to be half, then you wouldn't have a rebua. You'd have a rectangle. So we need to, in my opinion, we're talking about something after it is. It's double, but it's folded, and it forms one, one zeret. And then you keep reading, it says that its width is also going to be a zeret. So its length and its width, in my opinion, when I read that, are the same. But 
It's folded. So the width is one. The, the length is going to be two, but it's going to be folded over so it does become a square. And the reason for this, most of the rabbinical authorities say that we want a pouch in it in order to place something inside this pouch. And we'll talk about that later on. Look, if you would, to verse 17. Now, it's the same material as of now that the ephod. So the breastplate is comprised of the same material, the same type of garment as the vest. But notice something more. This breastplate is going to have, verse 17, it's going to have attached to it. It's going to be filled with it, in it. It's going to have a feeling of, of stone. So this this breastplate is going to be made of the same material as the ephod, but attached to it, it's going to have placed in it a feeling. And this feeling is like you go to the dentist, you have a cavity, hope you don't, but they put a filling into it. it. It takes up space. So there's going to be stones, as we're going to see, placed upon this garment, the breastplate. And it's going to be very, very uh, clear how to do it. First of all, look again. And you shall fill it with a feeling of stone. And there's going to be four rows of stone. And let me just tell you, each row is going to have three stones. So four rows, three stones in each row. How many stones total? Obviously, four times three, 12. You think that's by chance? No. It has to do with the 12 tribes of Israel. We saw last week upon the ephod, there are shoulder straps, two. And on the shoulder straps, there were the, the stones place of shoham stones. And on them were engraved the names of Israel. Six names on each stone. Two stones, six times two, also 12. And the purpose is for the children of Israel, their names to be remembered as the priests would serve. Well, same things now. But instead of six names on one side, six names on the other, in the center, there's going to be those same 12 names, but written in four rolls with three stones in each row. Look, if you would, to the second part of verse 17. It says, A row of Odin pitda u varechet. This is the first row. The word, word Odin is a stone that is reddish because the word a dome, this is odem, but it comes from the same word. There's a reddish color. We're not sure what that stone is, nor are we sure what the next stone is, that, that pit da, because many will say topaz, but it's simply a guess. And then we have the word barachet, barachet. Most scholars will say emerald, and there's some basis for understanding it this way. This is the first row. The second row is nofech, nofech, here again. Some authorities say it's turquoise stone, but we're not sure. Then we have sapir, sapir is sapphire. And then we have yalom, which is diamond. So we have the first two rows, there's two more. The third row, look at verse 19. The third row is l'shem, we don't know what that is. Shevo. Here again, we do not know what that is. And achlama, achlama, again, we do not know. Some will say, I believe, amorous, but here again, it's simply a guess. The fourth row is tarshish. Some will say that's barrel, also a reddish, a burgundy color. And then shoham, here again, perhaps onyx, but we don't know. And the last one is yashfe. Yashfe could be jasper stone. And notice it says that these stones have a, a 
setting, we might say. We put the stone into a gold setting, and this shall be for their filling. So we have this material that's made of twisted linen and also scarlet or crimson and that royal purple and that uh, blue substance and also there's gold within it. All of that is the same fashioning material mixture of the vest. But this is an additional part that's placed on the vest and we know that it is comprised, this material, of 12 golden settings. These 12 golden settings have these 12 different stones which relate to the children of Israel. And how do we know that? Well, look at verse 21. And the stones shall be concerning the names of the children of Israel. Now, it's important because God... When the children of Israel are worshiping, and look at something, not just them, but the Israelites were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles to cause them to also worship. And there's a relationship between worship and Israel. So these 12 stones represent the 12 names of the children of Israel. 12 upon their stones and it should be engraved, these names should be engraved like the engraving of the singlet ring. The singlet ring showed ownership, authority. And this is why this phrase being used here, it talks about how they have authority, the high priests, in coming before God with these names upon their shoulders and upon the breastplate. Now, this is what's significant. These 12 names are written twice. I mentioned six names on one shoulder, six on the other, 12, and then again on the breastplate for a total of 24. And most see the number 24 or 12 times 12, 144. Both of these, 12, 24, and 144, are all related to the kingdom. As we see when we study Revelation chapter 21 and 22, that, that state, that final state of the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem. So these are engraven like the work of the singlet ring. A man, meaning each of these patriarchs, concerning his name, they shall be for the 12 tribes. And what's interesting is that we can't change the names. They have to be Reuben and Shimon and Levi and Judah. All of these names, they are going to be represented in the kingdom of God. This has great implications. And when you study the book of Revelation, you realize that not only are these 12 names appearing upon the 12 gates, but also there's an additional 12 names having to do with the foundations of the gates for the, the apostles. And we're talking about the 12 apostles. All of this shows the, the, the connection, the unity that God's going to bring between his old covenant people, which he's going to bring to faith in the new covenant message, and his new covenant people, which he brought to faith through that same message. There's going to be oneness, not a replacing and a casting away of the old, but a restoration, these two groups in one truth, and that truth is the gospel. Now verse 22. Beginning in verse 22, we're going to be focusing in on joining the breastplate, that breastplate of justice to the ephod, that vest. And we're going to see that there's an upper joining, and a lower joining. Now, we've already talked about the upper joining when we looked at the, the ephod last week. If you go back to verse 13, Exodus 28, verse 13, it says, Ve asita mish betsot zahaf. This is this engraving 
for the two stones, one on one shoulder, one on the other. So they also have an engraving, and it says immediately after that, verse 14, and two chains of gold, pure gold, woven or braided or pleated together, you shall make them work of braiding, they shall be for these uh, two chains of gold upon the, the settings. Now, what we find here is that these gold chains, they attach the stones that were on the shoulder straps to the ephod. We also are going to see something similar when we talk about the breastplate being attached to the ephod. Now we're ready to go back to verse 22. It says, And you shall make concerning the hoshen, the breastplate. And here again, it's all for join it together. You shall make shar shot. Now, if you are good in Hebrew, you've noticed back in verse 14, it says that you shall make, in verse 14, these uh, uh, chains, but this is the word, shar she rot. Here, we have a different, it's the same root, but we simply have the word shar shot. And some will say that one is masculine, one is feminine, one has a doubling of a word letter, the other doesn't, but we're still speaking about chains or, or golden cords or a rope-type substance that's made out of gold. So it may be constructed similarly, but not exactly the same, but it's still, if you keep reading, again, verse 22, you shall make concerning the breastplate at the end, chains, and they shall be, just like the ones we saw, they shall be pleated or braided, gold, pure gold. So up above, what joined the, the shoulder straps, that is the stones, are attached to the shoulder straps, but they are also attached in a unique way to the vest, that ephod. And now we're going to see the same thing concerning the breastplate. Now, some will say that they are joined together, these stones, and maybe we'll show you a picture of how some see them as being the, the breastplate attached and also the stones attached by their engraving to form that unit. So hopefully we'll show you a picture to make that clearer. Verse 23 and you shall make concerning the breastplate two rings. So now, in order to attach them, you have to have these rings, and these rings are of gold, and you shall put them, put these two rings upon the two ends of the breastplate. So earlier on, when we were talking about the shoulder straps and such, they also had this joining together, but it was somewhat different. Now on the breastplate up above, because it's going to be joined, and I mentioned this and I'm going to say it again, this breastplate is going to be joined to the ephod on the top, but also on the bottom. And there's a difference. Now, they both have, and we'll see this, they both have rings, golden rings, two at the top, and we'll see two on the bottom, on the edges of the the breastplate but we read verse 23 and you shall make concerning the breastplate two rings of gold you shall set the two rings upon the two ends of the cushion and you shall set the two braids of gold this would be those chains upon the two rings at the end of the breastplate. So just what we said, they're going to be joined. These rings are attached on the upper to the two ends, and they're going to be attached to the ephod. Some say specifically to those straps is where they are next to the stones, and you'll see this. 
Others see it differently, but we'll just go on and look at verse 20, 24. And you shall place the two braids of gold, these two uh, chains, upon the two rings at the end of the breastplate, verse 25, and the two ends of the two braids you shall put upon the two, and here it is, settings. So now this is important because we looked at it's tied to those two golden settings, and this is very significant. And you shall set it upon, it says, kitfot ha efot. Now this ends the debate because these settings are the golden ones where those two stones upon the shoulder straps because when we look at verse 25 at the end, it mentions these two shoulder straps of the ephod, ephod against or in front of, the ones in front of. So it's in the front of the person, not in the back. Obviously, they couldn't be joined underneath the arm, perhaps, but it says you do it on the front portion where these stones are. So it becomes very clear. Verse 26. And you shall make two rings of gold, and you shall set them upon the two ends of the, the breastplate upon the sides which pass which pass the, the ephod to its, its house. And its house means on the, the inner place. So this is very clear instructions on how they're being joined together. The house is probably what it's talking about, the places where the rings are attached at the ends, this, this joining together of the rings at that location. So all of this speaks about how they're joined, the breastplate, how it's joined to the ephod at the shoulder straps at the engraved places, the settings, the golden settings were those two uh, stones which have the six names of the children of Israel are. So the breastplate are connected to where the names of Israel appear and the breastplate itself has the 12 names of Israel. Now look at verse 27. Verse 27 shows a change. No longer are we talking about the, the bottom or excuse me, the top portion of the breastplate. Now we're dealing, in fact, with the lower portion, and it's going to be joined similarly, but there's some changes. Verse 27. And you shall make two golden rings, and you shall set them upon the two, notice this, the two shoulder straps of the ephod, but notice below it should be but here again, on the front. So now we see that it comes down, but the shoulder straps near the bottom. And I'll illustrate this when we look at it on a picture of it. You see that we're speaking about down below. And notice what it says. Keep reading. It says, a contrasting, it's joining from above. And it shall be at the, the making of this ephod, this, this uh, um, intelligence work of the ephod. Now, why do I say it's down below? Well, we've had the word lemata, but look at verse 28. We have a different word. Ve yik kesu, and the closing or the joining of the, the breastplate down below, but it's a different type. Now, here we have the modern root where we get the English word, where we get the Hebrew word for the English word zipper. And a zipper simply closes something together. This is not a zipper, but it's for the purpose of clothing, clothing, closing something. And notice how we read of it. Verse 28, and they shall close the, or fasten might be a better way to put it, the breastplate. Uh, with its rings to, 
to the rings of the ephod. So the breastplate, it has two rings down below. And it's going to be fastened as well to these uh, uh, shoulder straps down below. And it's going to have two rings. But you do it not with a golden chain or these two golden chains. You do it with patil tachelet. Patil is like a ribbon or a thread, but it's a thicker one. It's the same word, many of you are familiar with the term titsit, those uh, uh, eight cords or threads for the garment, the talit or the, the uh, um, four-corner garment that we wear all the time, not the talit, which is just for prayers, but the, the other one. This is the same word that's used in different places for that. So it's going to be a, a cord of techelet. And you can see the picture that it's not down below joined with gold, but with a fabric of techelet. And this should be for the, the intelligent making of the vest. And so that it does not come loose, that the breastplate does not come loose from the ephod. It has to be continuously joined. Up above with golden chains, down below with uh, cords or fabric of techelet. That's that blue, that turquoise color fabric that uh, we encounter so frequently in our study of the Mishkan of the Tabernacle. Verse 29. And Aaron and this breastplate is only for the high priests. And Aaron shall carry the names of the children of Israel upon Hoshin HaMishpat, the breastplate of justice upon his heart. And you can see where it goes, upon his heart. When he comes into the holy place or the sanctuary, and he does so for a remembering before the Lord continuously, always. So every time we see Aaron come into the holy place. He has his breastplate on, and he is doing so to bring, to intercede, most of the scholars say, intercede for the children of Israel before the Lord, and he does this always. Verse 30. Verse 30 is going to be our last verse. We read, And you shall set upon the breastplate of justice, and now we have two very unusual words and how they should be understood. We're talking about that you shall put the on the breastplate of righteousness these urim and turim. Now, probably English is going to say thurim, but there's no th in Hebrew. That's an air. It's turim. Urim and Tumim, excuse me. And the word Urim comes from the Hebrew word light. And the word uh, Tumim comes from the word for wholeness, completion, perfection. And notice that we return back to the phrase here, beginning in verse 29 and 30, Choshen Mishpat. Now, why do we call it the breastplate of judgment? Well, in this pouch, and this is what most authorities believe, in the pouch, remember, it's folded over. It's not half, but it was probably twice. The length was probably twice its width, but when it's folded, the width and the length are the same. It forms this pouch, and in this pouch are the urim and the tumim. And these were used, and there's much written about these, but not so much here. But it's believed that they were used in order to arrive at a just ruling. That the high priest would come in and he would speak to God in the holy place. And God would answer him by these urim and the tumim. But this is traditional. We'll see other where in the scripture that it alludes to this. But for our purpose today, just look at verse 30. And you shall set upon... The, the breastplate of justice, the urim and the tumim, and they shall be upon the heart of Aaron. 
Why specifically upon the heart of Aaron? Well, most would argue that the word heart has to do with thinking so that Aaron could have the right thoughts, that he could arrive at the right conclusion, the right justice for the children of Israel. It says, they shall be upon the heart of Aaron when he comes before the Lord. Aaron shall carry the justice of the children of Israel upon his heart, meaning that he's going to arrive at just rulings, just decisions through these Urim and Tumim for, for the children of Israel, but before the Lord, and this should be something always. Now, here again, do you think that we have the capacity to know how to construct these things, the Urim and the Tumim? No one knows what they are for certain. They're going to come back into the scriptures later on. But for our moment now, very is little is said, nothing about how to make them. But we learn something. God wants justice, right understanding truth to his covenant people. And worship is tied to this. And this is why I say, and I'll close with this. This is why there's a connection between worship and arriving at godly counsel, godly revelation. So we know what is his will for the purpose of carrying it out. So one aspect of worship is revelation. So I learn how to act, behave, what to do in order to live a praiseworthy life. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.